Welcome to PL Together Lounge Talks. I'm Adam Geller, founder and CEO of Edthena. Today, we're talking with Nina Gilbert. She's taught every grade level from kindergarten through college, and now she's the director of the Center for Excellence in Education at Morehouse College. Nina, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Adam. So uh, we've talked so far about school design and supporting teachers and supporting students. Now let's think about classrooms. And, and maybe, of course, classrooms might look different right now, but the idea of the, the space, physical or digital, that a teacher creates to hopefully kind of create opportunities for learning to occur. Uh, I'm curious about how culture plays into that classroom environment. I know that's something that you've been thinking a lot about. Uh, so, you know, first take us in, you know, uh, why does culture matter? Why, why do we need to care? Uh, I mean, you know, it's culture's, it's, it's one of those soft, squishy things. Why do we need to care about this soft, squishy thing called culture? Yeah, so when I think of culture, I think of a shared um, set of beliefs, right, and values. And if we are talking about the physical brick and mortar space, uh, culture is important because the climate of that space is going to be determined by um, how closely everyone in that building aligns themselves with the core values um, of the school, right, or of a classroom. Now that everyone has like uh, a different I guess, experience with the classroom or school setting. Uh, classes for some may be um, a, a brick and mortar space where everyone is socially distant from each other and folks are masked or they have face shields or your classroom space may be little squares on your device. Wherever it is, it has to be an emotionally safe space. Um, what I found even in higher ed that there are teachers, professors who have not created the type of culture that is welcoming or safe for learners. Um, and some people are really struggling with this digital environment. Um, some students really thrive in an environment where they can be more social, sometimes they're too social. Um, but now that folks are having uh, to connect digitally, even though our students are digital natives, this is different for them. And so when a teacher you know, says, hey, these are our expectations for this course, and um, these are the standard operating procedures for you know, how we engage with one another, um, if there's no way to build community in that space, I think it makes it harder for students to engage and feel comfortable um, in that space. And, and of course, I mean, you just kind of told that from the perspective of the higher ed uh, teacher who's working with higher ed learners, but I mean, that's the same, setting those protocol and, and expectations is the same thing that the, that the I'm in a mat. I'm hoping it's not true for them, but I know it probably is the kindergarten teacher who's managing students via video. Uh, what a challenge! But certainly early elementary, where that that's happening for sure. And uh, there's this great graphic I've been seeing on social media where it's like the difference between the early grades on video and the you know higher grades on the early grades. The kids are just you know like bouncing all around all corners, no expectations, going crazy. And the higher grades, they just have all their cameras off. And really, what it is is reflection of needing to establish those rules and norms. So, you know, maybe take us a little bit more into the tactical and practical then, you know, advise us as uh, someone who is leading learning right now, how do we, or, or maybe what should we be thinking about for setting that, those norms and, and kind of creating the culture so we can get to the shared values of our learning spaces when they're not physical? Yeah, so I think it's important that we identify some best practices, like curate some of uh, the content um, that 
uh, this is at least what I would do uh, at my center, curate great content that can be shared, uh, codify best practices, share those, but be really clear about what works. And I think, um, you know, trying, testing different uh, strategies and approaches, that's important. And to know that we're, I think COVID is giving us a reason to have some excuses, right? And do some excuse making like, hey, um, we're gonna try this, it may not work. If it does not work, we're gonna try something else. And so some of the things I've seen teachers uh, at the higher ed level and K-12 level try that I think are more effective is not feeling like you have to spend all 60 minutes of a class talking into a camera, right? Um, if it did not work face-to-face, -face, if lecturing <laughs> in front of the class did not work when we were all together, it is definitely not going to work now that we're remote. Um, so having breakout sessions, right? Going into rooms, pairing, still doing think, share, pair, uh, or think, pair, share, uh, in the Zoom breakout um, saying, hey, we're going to spend the first 15 or 20 minutes of this lesson with me explaining you know, this new concept. And then we're going to give you some time back to go work on that with the expectation that when we gather again, the, these will be your deliverables. Uh, giving students the opportunity to engage um, and more hands-on learning experiences and helping teachers understand the difference between um, online learning and distance learning. Uh, online is what you and I are doing right now, right? But you can still give an assignment, a project, an activity um, while we're distant from one another with the expectation that you complete this assignment in this project and you come back ready to present your project to the class. So I've seen that students have been more engaged when teachers have used that type of approach versus everyone, especially in the K-12 uh, um, sector, everyone, you know, shiny faces, fully dressed in front of the camera at eight o'clock and you're Zooming all day, um, it's, it's not as effective. Uh, and I don't care if you are a student at a traditional middle or high school, or if you are like some of the students I work with on film sets, where you are an actress, you happen to be also a fifth grader, but you are an actress on a very popular series and your teacher still expects you to complete your work. And so I've seen you know, students who film a scene and spend a, the next hour doing, sitting and listening to a lecture that is really about the same thing they film. It's a historical piece. Uh, for instance, if a student is in a film about the Civil War and her fifth grade teacher is covering the Civil War, it's, there's a way for that student to take her real lived experience and apply that to whatever assignment her teacher is giving her and make that more engaging. So I do think COVID-19, this pandemic, this remote, the shift to remote learning has given teachers and schools an opportunity to kind of rethink how we engage students uh, and give them exciting, engaging um, activities and assignments. It was a good reminder that you gave us there of the difference between online teaching and distanced teaching and all that distance learning that, you know, the online is not a requirement for the distance part and kind of freeing people up to be independent learners more. Uh, let, let's take a, uh, not the same thing. I, you know, I want to make sure I'm not saying it as if I'm able to conflate it, but when I hear culture, I think there's another topic you know, we should be talking about, you know, culture is something you can create, but there's also another thing that you can do as a, as a teacher and a leader, which is think about how to create, to practice, should I say, culturally responsive teaching. And so, you know, that feels important right now, um, because there's 
a lot going on in students' lives and in their communities that may be different than it was a year before. So how should we be thinking about the kind of mindsets of being aware of culturally responsive teaching and, and kind of implementing some of those things, taking them from a theoretical or, or PowerPoint style way of talking about it into the like doing of it for right now? I think it's, it's tough and it's tough regardless of your own ethnic or racial background or cultural background, it's still tough because we are you know, not monolithic people, none of us are. And so I, as a teacher or educator of color, I could think that I'm being culturally responsive uh, or, or responsible as I you know, engage with my students, but I still may not share the same lived experiences as the students that I'm, I'm teaching, right? And so I always say, start with empathy, right? And be sure to listen and listen to understand and um, build community, meaning build a safe place for students to share their concerns, share their experiences, but with some clear guidelines and parameters. So this is not the time where during our community building um, session during our class that you share things that may not be for the good of the group, but um, the teacher has to be clear about how to guide a conversation. Um, if the conversation is around the current political climate, uh, making sure that students, regardless of their views or the views of their family or their community, that they feel respected, that they feel heard. Um, but if you have a culture already that's a little willy nilly and you've not set clear rules and guidelines, it might not be a good idea to open up a conversation that could be volatile if you don't have a safe uh, and respectful community already established uh, with your, your class or within your school. Um, but I do think it's important to check in with students um, ar uh, around their social and emotional health and wellness. We have students who are experiencing loss. They are, they've lost on the one end of the spectrum They've just lost connection with their, their peers, with their teachers, uh, custodians, right? With the people, the lunch lady, right? So that's a real loss, especially in communities where loss is very common. Um, and then you have students who are experiencing um, real loss, like they live in multi-generational families and homes. And so they have either grandparents or other family members who are ill or those that they can't see because you know they need to social distance. So they've lost that as well. And then we, you know, unfortunately have I know several families who actually uh, lost family members to COVID. Um, and so to understand that students are going through that, not to mention those whose family members have lost employment, right? And so what was very normal and common to just have you know three meals a day you're not getting one of those meals because you don't get to eat at school. You're not getting another meal because your family member may be, or your parent uh, may be unemployed or underemployed. And you can't even go out to get food because the neighborhood stores are either understocked or closed. Um, to have the teacher say, everyone turn on your computer and let's go over you know, today's assignment, right? knowing that a student has to unpack all of that, right? And be prepared and present. Um, so just making sure that if a student doesn't have his or her, her camera on, it's okay. You don't know what's behind that. You know, if they don't have a green screen and a virtual background, you know, they may not want to turn their camera on. Um, but sometimes turning that camera on will allow a teacher to see inside of a student's life in a way they've not been able to see before. Um, and even that could be troubling for some of our students who feel like they don't want people to see inside of their home. Um, yeah, so there's just so much to think about. So when we think about culture and we think about being culturally responsive and um, I think it does require training um, because uh, every situation is going to be completely different. 
you know, I, I'm thinking about how if culture is, classroom culture is who we as a community of learners want to be, that then the kind of idea of the culturally responsive uh, part of it from the educator's perspective is really trying to answer who are we and knowing who we, are, we each individual learner is so that then it can inform who they will be together in that kind of classroom culture. I like the kind of interplay between the two of them that you were, you were setting up there, that they're, they're, neither of them's in isolation. That's right. Empathy is so important though. If we can lead and teach with empathy, um, that will allow us to connect with our students regardless of their background, regardless of our background, um, and also hopefully model that for the students who rely on us to set the tone. Well, Nina, we need to take a break but we'll be back to continue this conversation. If you are just joining us and wondering what we've already talked about or what we're going to talk about next, head over to pltogether.org for the rest of this conversation as well as others. Nina, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.